right, it's about time we get started. Actually, we have still a few people coming in, so we'll give them half a minute to sit down. All right, let's. So, um, good morning, my name is Federico Lucifredi. I'm a product management director working in the storage group and I'm joined by two of my colleagues. Hi everyone, good morning, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Sean Cohen, I'm a, a manager in our uh, OpenStack product management group. I've been overseeing storage cloud for more than a decade now and I'm four years with Red Hat, uh, specifically doing this type of things. So. Uh, Kyle Bader, Senior Solutions Architect at Red Hat, um, working primarily on architecting and doing performance profiling on Ceph clusters. All right. So we have a fairly packed agenda for today. We want to give you a pretty wide view of how quality of service works in the public cloud, in OpenStack, with Ceph, and then how it all comes together. So let's get started with block storage quality of service in the public cloud as our foundation step. So why does this matter? If you have been following OpenStack, you may have noticed that OpenStack is becoming dominant in the telco space. And wherever OpenStack goes, Ceph goes with it. Uh, more than 50% of clusters out there, according to the OpenStack Foundation, are backed by Ceph storage. If you have a telco workload, every telco workload requires a database as part of its deployment. Every database as part of its deployment requires quality of service. Hence, here we are. Now, there is an additional dimension to this, which is that you cannot really have QoS without uh, capacity planning and uh, public cloud QoS has sort of established itself as a de facto standard from the point of view of the users. They are so used to seeing public cloud operate in a certain way, they kind of expect to be able to do the same thing in more private environments. Now, if somebody wonders about the icon, it's um, a quote from the latest Tron movie at the end when the hero uh, is being defeated, he says, I fight for the user. Then he falls in the sea of simulation and gets decompiled. But for that moment, he has the right intention. So here is the problem. Some workloads need deterministic performance from block storage volumes. The most typical enterprise workloads that require QoS are databases. Jitter-sensitive workloads like video streaming are another common example. These are workloads that depend on constant latency measures to perform adequately. A variance in network latency is actually called jitter, if you're not familiar with the term. And here we're talking about network-based storage, hence the term comes in. A second class of problem addressed by quality of service is the so-called noisy neighbor. In a virtual environment, this occurs when an instance starves other instances of, shared, of a shared resource. Um, this results in performance issues to the VMs sharing the same infrastructure. In our case, the same storage cluster. Finally, operators need to run capacity planning exercises. Adding capacity before the users need it, that is the expectation of a cloud. If you want a 90s flashback, the original title we had for this talk was the James Carville version, which was, it's all about capacity planning. Stupid. Now, there are two options when it comes to virtual disk storage for your instances. Instance storage, which is also referred to as ephemeral, and persistent volumes. Once attached, these virtual disks can be formatted with your operating system's tooling and behave like any standard disk. Uh, 
Key differences stem from the fact that instance storage is physically part of the host that runs your instance, whereas persistent storage is remotely connected over the network. Instance storage offers larger size volumes and may hold the edge in absolute performance because of its proximity, but um, is lost once the instance is terminated, hence the ephemeral term. Permanent storage is much more featureful. In particular, it offers facilities like snapshots that have come to dominate provisioning and backup strategies in cloud infrastructure. Now, multiple volumes of either type can be attached to an instance, and you can even mix types. Ephemeral volumes can be attached only at boot time, however. While persistent storage can be added at any time or removed by the user during operation. The block device mapping facility in AWS allows you to create really complex topologies of, of drives uh, to be associated with the instance at boot time. It is even possible to attach multiple volumes to an instance and build software RAID on top of them. Please don't do that. As a Ceph person, I already have a naturally dim vision about RAID, but, the pub, uh, but in the public cloud, you need your mother's written permission before you use RAID. If the why is not clear, I'm happy to take questions on that later. There are some very specific cases where that makes sense but not the usual ones. Now, in June of 2012, AWS began offering SSDs as a higher performance alternative to magnetic storage. And over time introduced multiple options with different performance levels and costs. Some instances, some instance types now include SSD backed instance store to deliver very high random IO performance types like i2 and r3 being the first to support trim. Instance types themselves have evolved to include high I.O. instances, the i2 I was mentioning, I'm that aimed at delivering high IOPS from eight local SSDs, while dense storage instances, D2, offer the lowest price per disk um, for a throughput problem and balance constant performance. These use 24 magnetic drives locally. In other words, there are way too many options to discuss. So I'm just going to focus on what we need here. Oh, and some of them have burstable IOPS, just to make things more complicated. So let's focus on the essentials. Persistent volumes are what we care about here. And persistent volumes in AWS are provided by the EBS, Elastic Block Storage Service. You can have EBS-backed instances, meaning when you start the instance, you can get an ephemeral volume for some instance types, and you get an EBS volume for some other instance types, depending on what instance type you chose. So um, in these instances, EBS is your boot volume. Regardless, at runtime, you can attach additional volumes, uh, regardless of what your boot volume is. EBS volumes can be SSD or magnetic, and you can add volumes at runtime, which you cannot do with ephemeral. You can only do that at boot time with ephemeral. Critically, you choose the volume type. How many do you have? What type they are? What IO characteristics do you want? And very important, as of 2017, you can now resize live volumes, and why this matters will be apparent in a second. So now imagine, um, well, uh, there is one more thing that I should mention before I give you an example. There are additional uh, services that Amazon provides. CloudWatch, which provides monitoring metrics, and for volumes, it has interesting things like the ones that I um, screenshotted here on the side. Bandwidth, IOPS, read and write separated, latency, and a few more. These are built into the system if you have an EBS uh, provision IOPS volume. And um, the other aspect is that CloudFormation, the automation platform of AWS, allows you to um, carry out automation actions on the properties of the volumes. So let's see an example. 
a volume is running, a CloudWatch alarm fires saying um, this volume is at 90% full or 80% full, whatever the, the threshold was. It can trigger a, a cloud formation script that you prepared that automatically increases the size of the drive and then running through some automation that you will have to write stretches the file system. But all of this can be done live and the problem is remediated while you were looking at your uh, cell phone and you just became aware of it. So this is pretty cool, but there is more that we can do. Here is an example of an EBS volume. This is the most common one uh, for uh, provision IOPS, GP2, general purpose SSD. Um, SSD backed, recommended by uh, AWS for boot volumes and low latency applications like bursty databases. What is interesting here, you have all the specs, that's great, but what is interesting here is that the IOPS performance of the volume is directly tied to its size. If you want to provision IOPS, all you do is change the size of the volume. That is a general property that holds across EBS volumes with provisioned IOPS. With storage space comes IO performance. You can attach additional twists like bursting capacity or EBS optimized EC2 instances which have an additional dedicated 125 megabits per second link uh, used only for storage in addition to the other link used to access all other services but it always comes back to the single combined dimension of space and provision IOPS. With elastic volumes introduced this year, one can reprovision the size and, the result, and as a result, the provisioned IOPS of a, of a volume. You can do this live with a running system attached to it. You can also change the volume type effectively altering the formula that controls how many IOPS you get for the size of the volume. Uh, there are limits to what is allowed. Uh, GP2 and um, IO1 can be transformed in all other volume types. Uh, while um, while um, IO1, I'm sorry, GP2 and SC1, while IO1 and ST1 can only walk the list to the right. So IO1 can become ST1 or SC1. Um, ST1 can only become SC1. So there are only some transformations that you can make live. And there are other limitations. The live um, volume size change can only increase the size of the volume. You cannot shrink it. You have to take the volume offline to shrink it. But it's still um, pretty amazing. The best part is that now you can, lose, you can use CloudWatch to look at uh, at these volumes and you're not just adding space, you're adding performance. So you could have a CloudWatch metric that says you're 90% of the way there with the IOPS that are assigned to this drive. Let's increase the size so it gets more IOPS using the same mechanism with no halt, no interruption in the system. This is not even a um, scale out of type of pattern where you kill an instance and you replace it with another. It's a live instance that a live instance that's being modified. Now for comparison, the Google way. Google, Google Compute Engine does not have as many options as AWS, but what it has is always excellent. Performance is predictable and scales nearly with size um, until it reaches instance or volume limits. Google uses exactly the same capacity-based model Amazon AWS pioneered with different constants and different numbers, but the principle is the same. When you need more disk or better performance, simply resize your disk to add more storage space, throughput, or IOPS. Volume limits are determined by two things. We didn't detail them here because there are too many different limits, but um, the volume limits are, are determined by the storage technology and then the instance limits are determined by the um, instance network egress um, limits, and those are shared. If you have multiple volumes, the instance limits apply across all of those volumes. Instring interestingly, obviously there are differences from AWS, but one of them that's interesting is um, 
um, the instance limit for SSD changes significantly depending on the number of virtual CPUs. So if you have a ton of virtual CPUs, like more than 32, I think, then your limit increases significantly. And then there is another step, I think, over 60 or 61. So why do we care? Because this is how the public cloud vendors do quality of service. Simple, effective, understood by the users. The admin scales in a single dimension, doesn't care which the user is provisioning for. More gigabytes, more IOPS, it's just more, more, more. Flatten two different scaling factors into a single dimension. The operator needs to act, adds capacity to add IOPS anyway, so it might as well give the benefit of both storage and IOPS to the user. And the users are coming to this expecting um, the same QoS format that they're used to from the public cloud. It's what they learned, they're familiar with it. So to my closing point, we can build you a cloud like the big boys. OpenStack Cinder will be able to set QoS limits based on provisioned capacity and let my colleagues show you how we are making this possible. Thank you very much, Federico. All right, so we heard how the big boys are doing it. Um, let's see how we can do it in OpenStack and open source. Um, and one of the things we've been busy uh, this season is actually to see how we can address the, the, the workloads requirements. Uh, keep, it in, keep in mind that at the end of the day, we're servicing the workloads. Uh, the public way, you saw the Google, the Amazon way, the elasticity required to uh, uh, provide that uh, uh, consolidated dimensions of both uh, throughput capacity in a cloud fashion. But at the end of the day, what we care about is this, is the workloads we're serving on top, right? And when we look at the frameworks that are being used today in OpenStack, which become the de facto private cloud, uh, uh, cloud infrastructure um, today, uh, we see that most of the frameworks, right, uh, are using some sort of a database. <laughs> and uh, all the way from Rails with MySQL, WISA with the uh, SQL Server from Microsoft, means with MongoDB and uh, et cetera. Uh, all of them are basically using database. And the database themselves also need persistent storage. They need performance. And each one of them has different character characterizations. We, we talked about volume types a bit earlier. Volume types, if we uh, want to uh, uh, resolve the, the commonality, it's like the storage tiers. We, we, um, and if we look at what is in OpenStack, right, so our, uh, if we compare it to EBS from Amazon, our equivalent is Cinder in OpenStack. And, and what we're seeing that a lot of the customers over the years, over the last few years actually, are uh, moving away from the default LVM, which is open source but limited, to Ceph. Uh, Ceph has been now become the de facto storage backend software defined storage open source to OpenStack. And uh, we just had the recent survey from the OpenStack Foundations. Uh, Ceph is now leading the charge with, with more than 50% in production uh, workloads. Um, so it's not a coincidence that we dedicated the, the innovation and this talk today to these two technologies. But before we even talk about Ceph and what we can do to match up with the uh, big players in the public space. Let's do a quick history lessons and the road pretty much to, to quality of service in Cinder. Um, so the generic work was actually introduced already in OpenStack Grizzly uh, somehow four years ago. Uh, the seeds were there. Uh, at Havana release at the end of 2013, we were able to add the Cinder and Nova. Nova deals with the, uh, the quality of service enforce enforcement on the hypervisor level, right? Uh, the, the front end for quality of service, if you will. And then we reached the maturity point already in that API around uh, ice house when you had a lot of back fixes to the quality of service API is a, a lot of more velocity around backends uh, that supports uh, uh, that uh, Cinder quality of service. Um, and in Juno, we basically add, were able to add the Horizon dashboard as well. So it's not just API and CLI driven. And, and the basic point is we're using, we're using volume types. So the way it works, you are able to expose, oh, I have actually a slide that later I can show you, in, in the dashboard, we're mapping different volume types to your class of storage. So if you want a whole flash, SSDs, right, you can actually create a, a, a tier 
And, and that tier is associated to a specific instance. You can map uh, the relevant capabilities and expose the relevant capabilities of the backend uh, using the quality service API uh, via uh, what we call extra specs. So each driver can actually uh, uh, basically introduce more extra specs for their uh, specific, if you want, secret sauce, right? How they, they basically do the quality of stuff at, at the backend level. So from the front end, this is, as I said, this is basically the front end to uh, the hypervisor level. Uh, we have a total bytes. Uh, 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 limited limit by IOPS, so you can do like total IOPS per second, writes, etc. At the back end, this is where I, I indicated that the, the vendors can introduce more and more functionalities based on how they do quality of service in the specific storage arrays. Um, and the thing is, it's not consistent, right? Each vendor can basically use its own extra specs to deliver something which is not uh, unified, if you will. So the API today is not unified. Uh, so H H T H HP FreePower, for example, uh, use uh, uh, latency and priority, priority beyond the, the regular caps. SolidFire uh, uh, use burst as well for the, for the IOPS caps. NetApp use a quality of service uh, policy groups through extra specs. Huawei priority uh, through their extra specs, et cetera. So it's, it's it's there, it's, uh, you can use it, but each vendor basically uh, exposes a different set. What it means for you as administrator or a cloud uh, 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 storage manager, right? It means that you need to, to modify or, or manage your cloud storage and performance uniquely for each one of your vendors, right? It's not the cloud way that Federica showcased earlier, which as a user, I don't care, <laughs> right? I set a policy and it's all dimensions and it's consistent across all of these vendors. Uh, this is how it looks in the front end. So you have a volume type, so you create a volume, you map it to a specific type and a specific quality of service spec, right? So this is pretty much how it looks. Uh, also on, on the uh, CLI level with the relevant specs create, pretty straightforward. Um, and this is all the different uh, uh, capabilities that expose it. This is not all of the, the list, this is just a partial list, right? Because each vendor can add a different set of classes that they, they can uh, work uh, and expose, but the key is the quality of service values are currently are able to be set static values. Remember the public cloud with the dynamic, right? This is static. Um, and if we wanted some of the example, like uh, the other co competitive propriety storage, uh, so, and Okada is the last release we do of OpenStack. We just uh, finished upstream and we're starting the Pike release. Uh, and in the latest uh, a, a, um, Okada release, we have a solid fire that basically now can recognize four quality of uh, 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 service SPAC keys along basically different options. So they use scaled IOPS. Uh, uh, they, 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 can, they can flag that basically to look if it's like a scale min, scale, scale max, scale burst, right? Remember the burst that uh, 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 um, uh, we see earlier in the other backends of, of NetApp, now SolidFire is part of NetApp, they're basically leveraging the same stack. Uh, if we look at scale IO, uh, 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 max IOPS per gigabyte, right? Uh, max bandwidth per gigabyte. Now, these keys are unique to these vendors, right? Nobody else right now in OpenStack uses these keys. All right, so to summarize, uh, the path from Grizzly until Okada, basically from 2013 to 2017, quality of service values in Cinder currently are able to be set to static values. What if, what if there was a way to drive quality of service limit values based on the volume capacities rather than the static volume. And this is what we basically innovated. So the, the, the code that we're presenting today is actually gonna be introduced in the Pike release. The code actually is there already. So if you're an upstream guy, you can actually start test it on your own. It's generic. It works with any backend, <laughs> right? Uh, you can still use your solid fire and all other propriety storage alongside with Ceph or even LVM, but this is the same API uh, that basically allows you uh, 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 to provision IOPS per volume basis with the IOPS value adjusted based on the volume size, right? So it's not static. We actually look at the volume size to provision the quality of service. So it allows you as an OpenStack uh, uh, administrator operators to basically cap usage uh, to define limits based on the space 
uh, uh, usage as well as throughput, in, uh, pretty much combining or flattening, as Federica mentioned, the two dimensions into one, right? It's not just IOPS, not just gigabits. We, we do a flattened approach. Uh, so you can consume it basically associating IOPS uh, and size to prov provide tiers, right? So here I'm giving an example of gold, silver, and bronze with different uh, uh, scale options, right? Um, so when we look at the capacity to derive IOPS, right, this is, we have to introduce basically a new set of keys uh, that, at the API level. And these keys basically now uh, allows you to do read IOPS per second per gigabyte, right? So instead of having just a, a, a IOPS or a gigabyte and max, max here and max there, we have one keys to do it all in a unified manner. Very elegant, right? What about the other specs that we had in quality of service? Well, I mean, this is like four years of development of quality of service, right? They still work. The functions are the same as the current, but except they are scaled by the volume size, right? You can still use your old quality of service principle, now basically adding another dimension to it. Scale. Um, it means a lot of things to a lot of people, but I want Carl actually to walk us through what scale actually means when we talk about quality of service in a private cloud or even running OpenStack in your, as a service provider, right? So I want to go so much as to say it's theory, but it's, it's, this is just kind of basic capacity planning type stuff. So there's a, um, a model that people apply to a lot of different systems, database systems, storage systems in particular, called the universal scalability model. Um, and a, a lot of people mistake what scale means. In, in this context, what I'm talking about is scaling the client load. And then I'll also talk about the other um, dimensions that you can scale in. Because with a, a scale-out system like Ceph, you can also scale the back-end capacity. But in this particular case, we're talking about client workload scale. So you start off, you have one unit of work, right? You have, you have a single volume. And if you provision a second volume, you should get twice as much work from the system. And you can continue down this as you add more and more volumes to your cluster. And you'll what most people will expect is that for each added volume, they're going to get a consumer increase in performance from the additional volumes. And as long as you maintain this relationship where if you have a volume that's you know, providing a, a fixed uh, amount of throughput in terms of performance and you add more volumes, you're, you should see a, a, a scaled um, increase. So if you have, if each volume is doing 100 IOPS and you have five of them, then in aggregate they should be doing 500 IOPS. If they're doing less than that, then you have sublinear scaling, which is not all too um, uncommon with systems. Um, and usually the cause of that um, is contention and coherency delay. So for a, a fixed backend, so if you have a single Ceph cluster behind your um, behind your OpenStack installation, and it's providing block storage services to a, 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 a number of volumes, um, it's gonna, you're going to see linear performance as you continue to add volumes if they're capped at a fixed IOPS rate per volume. And what you effectively want to use is you want to use OpenStack Cinder along with IOPS limits and um, volume quotas so that you can limit the number of, um, it's, it's basically a form of emission control for capacity planning. So you're only going to admit an, the amount of load that your backend is going to be able to um, sustain linear growth so that the tenants that are added, provisioning the volumes are getting, um, are, are able to hit the QoS uh, guarantees. If you start to add too many volumes, more than the backend can, can support, particularly in disk-based systems, is the contention, um, the contention will kind of plateau the performance. And then because they're um, rotational media and they have to seek, when you have too much seeking activity, it, it actually acts as kind of a coherency delay in the universal scalability model. So you'll, and you'll see that, like in this picture here, if each block is the height of the block represents the um, throughput in terms of performance. As you start adding more volumes past the, what the cluster is capable of doing, the height of them shrinks. 
in order to accommodate them. And ideally, you don't want that because now each tenant is seeing less throughput for their volumes. And so they're going to say, you know, I'm, I, I need more I.O. So maybe they will provision more volumes and then it's it kind of, you know, this is a downward spiral. So you really need to do admission control at the front end. And this is what some of these tools that are now landing in Cinder um, can help you do in terms of being able to do it um, binding capacity to, um, to a unit of storage. So again, the, the, you have the diminishing returns from contention when the, when the back end starts to become overloaded. And then in the case of disk-based clusters, you see negative returns from the incoherency or the, the seek delays that are being imparted on the system because you have so many different volumes, you're starting to get the, the disk back end to start thrashing. Now, SSD-based clusters are a little bit different um, because they don't have to seek. Um, and they tend to be limited only by the CPU of the system. The CPU of the system because it's having to transmit the bytes over the wire and do check summing and um, you know, shuttling these bits back and forth between the hypervisor and the backing storage system. And so you don't have so much of this negative returns and that, in, that kind of introduces a, a really neat, neat feature which we see in the public cloud in that you don't necessarily have to have volumes that or a fixed size. You, you, you're not, your admission control is not based on the number of volumes, but by the aggregate capacity. And how you divide up that aggregate capacity doesn't have to be done in fixed size chunks. So if you want to increase the size or the, the performance of each block, then you need to have faster media. But if you want to have more blocks, if you want to increase the amount of block, uh, block storage devices, that you're, uh, you can support in your environment, you scale out your, your backend Ceph cluster, right? You add, you add additional nodes to it, and then typically you're able to have uh, more volumes. Now, the volume quota, like I said, is less relevant for SSDs because there's that low coherency delay, um, very, very fast access. So now what you can do is you can have different size blocks, right? It doesn't, the, the height, Right? It still plateaus when the system is reaching its full potential in the back end. But the size, you can have some people that have small volumes that are delivering a small number of IOPS and some people that have large volumes that are delivering a lot of IOPS. And how those stack up to meet the, kind of the, the top level of performance doesn't matter so much. But it kind of flattens, flattens the d different dimensions that you need to think about when you're scaling as an operator. You don't care whether or not you're provisioning more capacity because they're putting more byte bits down, or if you need to provision more capacity because your users need more IOPS. Um, you just add more, right? You, you, you see that by flattening them into the two dimensions, you just say, okay, I'm at 80% of my cluster. I'm gonna add more nodes to my backend. Now I can support more, um, more SSD-based storage. I don't care whether it's because they're provisioning the volumes at a larger size because it's they need more performance, or whether because they you know, need to store more, store more data. So we did some testing um, of this, and um, uh, we, we only have actual uh, the, the data in these next few slides for disk-based clusters. But kind of the trend that we saw is that um, with uh, the particular cluster we had, for each 7200 RPM disk, you can support about one volume at 100 IOPS, which is equivalent to what the, the, the average throughput of a magnetic EBS volume. So if you want to build a storage backend, by doing admission control and limiting the number of volumes, and by setting each of the volumes limits to 100 IOPS, you can see that you can kind of guarantee QoS up to the number of OSDs in the cluster. And this, this was a smaller size cluster, we had 40, but right around 40 is kind of the inflection point where you, you see the, the blue line start to go down and that your, your IOPS per volume is, is dipping below um, kind of the, the ideal uh, 100 IOPS mark. Uh, we did some similar testing um, in a hyperconverged configuration. Um, and we saw pretty close to the same thing where it was right around 40, um, uh, 40 uh, volumes uh, per 40 OSD cluster, which is actually really convenient because 
then you can just count the number of OSTs in your cluster, and that's roughly how many volumes you can support at 100 IOPS. Um, and then we did some testing. Um, this is, again, with hyperconverged, but we ran, um, we had an additional workload in the VMs, and we saw that the performance was plateauing um, uh, before the 40 mark, and when we looked back at the system metrics, um, this is, it's plateauing instead of becoming retrograde because disks actually were not the bottleneck here. The CPU w between the compute workload and the storage workload was the, the, the limiting factor. So had our, had our um, hyperconverged nodes had more CPU, um, you know, if we had a different lab configuration, we would expect to um, see more, more linear scaling up to 40 uh, volumes and then see retrograde performance at, after that point because we would be, again, disk limited instead of CPU limited. So what, is this, what does this mean to someone that's uh, planning on deploying or architecting an OpenStack cloud or, um, and is uh, using kind of a, a Ceph-based uh, Ceph storage backend? Well, for your spinning-based um, tiers of storage, if you want to provide your tenants with a magnetic EBS style, um, for each OSD that you have, and in our particular configuration, it was 7,200 RPM basic SATA with a uh, write-back cache just configured in a single disk grade zero um, with SSD journal. We were able to do about one volume per OSD and hit our QoS targets. Now on Flash, it gets a little bit more complicated because for the most part, you're CPU limited. And if you were um, looking at it from the right perspective, which tends to be um, more uh, resource intensive, um, across all the different Flash um, configurations we've tested with uh, various different vendors, they all kind of find harmony at this like 500 IOPS per gigahertz on the OSD host. So if your OSD host has you know, two 12 cores, um, two 12 core Xeons with you know, 2.4 gigahertz, you multiply that out. And that tends to be, at least CPU wise, how much they can maintain in terms of IOPS. Then you have to make sure that the, the SSDs you have in that are consumerly sized and that they can reach those performance uh, targets as well so that they don't become the bottleneck. Um, but, but yeah, this, you know, so in this way, you can use um, the emission control components of Cinder, um, in the case of disk-based clusters, use volume quotas, 100 IOPS limits, and then for your, pr to pr uh, provide a EBS provisioned IOPS style service, if you have the right uh, combination of, um, uh, of uh, OSD host, which we've done some reference architectures for. Um, they're on uh, redhat.com. Uh, you can provide now with these new changes in Cinder um, IOPS based on the capacity of the volume. So if you, you know, wanted to do it the same way as uh, provisioned IOPS or Google Persistent Disk SSD, you would set it to 30 IOPS per gigabyte of storage. And so if you had a uh, 100, 100 gigabyte volume, you would get 3,000 IOPS from it. So where does this, where does this, leave, this leave us? Well, we have the magnetic, we have the provisioned IOPS. Uh, you know, the, the only last piece of the puzzle is bursting. And in order to do um, bursting, you need a little bit more than admission control. Um, you need kind of a, a like a reservation style system. And in order to do a reservation style system in a, when you have distributed storage on the back end, it actually becomes much more complicated than if you have an appliance and you're just delivering a block device over something like iSCSI. Because the protocol itself is distributed and then the storage is distributed. So you have to do all the accounting for the QoS and the, the, you know, the, um, the shares in a distributed fashion. Now this is, there's a paper that describes how to do this, and um, there are some people that are working upstream in Ceph um, to try to figure out how to implement um, this particular QoS algorithm. Um, it's called DM clock, if anyone's interested. 
um, into Ceph, but that's really what would need to be done in order to get a general purpose SSD type um, volume from Ceph so that you are able to burst, uh, have burstable capacity where it's kind of like a, a leaky bucket algorithm where you, know, you, you add a certain number of credits for the, for the volume over a period of time and then they can burst and consume those credits and then the back end is able to account for all those sorts of things. Uh, no, no, the bottom part is not done. So the first two are, are ready to go as of the, the Pike release. Um, general purpose SSD is, is yeah, it's, it's a work in progress. It's a, it's a tricky problem. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, the number one, uh, t you know, people typically will deploy, or, you know, the last, for the last few years, they've been deploying disk-based clusters and they get their open stack up and running, and then they have some tenants that have some demanding workloads, and they say, hey, I want, you know, they're all asking for the provisioned IOPS, and so, um, you know, we, we worked on figuring out that puzzle because we wanted to have the, the kind of the two ends of the performance spectrum, and this, the, you know, kind of bursting is, is the last, the final frontier. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. So you can stay on stage because we're going to have, probably have more questions. And for you, can, you can join me as well. Um, we're almost wrapping time, uh, but there's still missing pieces. And there's great tools that you can use today to get equivalent uh, experience. Um, so let's start with monitoring. Obviously, we don't have Cloud Band, uh, a Watch in OpenStack yet, but we have telemetry, which is our alarming system and, and monitoring, and there's Gnocchi uh, plugging that you can connect today to Grafana dashboard, and this is just a screenshot from Grafana, to get that statistics, right, in terms of what's going on in your uh, quality of service uh, uh, world. Um, the generic approach we, we drove into Pike release is leveraging QMO. Uh, QMO has na na uh, native tools such as block stats you can poke. Uh, uh, it's also exposed via Libvirt, but not yet in OpenStack. So that's maybe another approach we can take and get the statistics out of QMO. When it comes to Ceph, uh, Ceph RBD client stats socket, another area you can uh, pull from and, and get the statistics. But what will be really cool is to see if we can get innovation into OpenStack alarming to basically do it event triggering, right? Uh, Federica mentioned the Amazon uh, 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 pretty much uh, automation, right? So you, you can figure out something is happening, that automate, automating uh, uh, trigger will, will kick in and, and will do that work for us instead of manual, uh, which is what we have today. So we are getting close. You can do all of that already today in a capacity uh, 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 driven way in OpenStack starting Pike release, but you're still missing pieces, right? And this is, if you're upstream contributor, uh, <laughs> this is an area you can actually impact and drive in. When it comes to elasticity, right? So change volume types limits, right? right? You saw that Amazon can actually change types on the fly. Um, I wanna increase volumes, hot grow, um, dynamically reconfigure them at runtime. So there's a lot of more, more work that needs to kick in. It's not just the fundamentals at the Cinder level. And that a lot of the work is not just Cinder or, or Ceph. Uh, and uh, yeah, actually, on the, on the Ceph side, the, all those elasticity things can be done. It just hasn't been bubbled up into, into the Cinder APIs to expose that features. Like, since, since the very beginning, you've been able to hot grow an RBD volume from Ceph. Um, make it larger and then extend the file system. Um, you can change an RBD from, uh, from one pool to another. Um, so the back end supports it. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of, yeah. of getting it into OpenStack. So you saw there's a great progress, but there's uh, still a lot of way to go and you can actually impact <laughs> uh, if you're a contributor. Um, but all of it is moving forward to basically drive us to a point where we need to maintain the same service level in our hybrid cloud, right? How many of you in the audience use more than OpenStack today? They use Google, AWS, right? I know a few, you're already here. You wanna maintain the same service that you basically provide to your workloads consistently. It doesn't matter if it's OpenStack, if it's Google, if it's Amazon, right? You still, need, and this is the way to go. And, and by opening that new APIs, we actually be, be able to uh, set the same principles for us to manage quality of service 
for storage in a cloud fashion. And that's what it's all about, right? Um, so with that, I want to open it for uh, some questions. I know that we're at the top of the time. Uh, Yeah. Can you repeat um, the question? Um, so, so can you shrink, um, what's the problem with shrinking a volume in AWS? You cannot do it live. You can shrink the volume if you take it offline. But right now you cannot do it live. I don't have an insight into what the, the issue on the AWS side is. If you choose the right file system, you can shrink a file system in Linux. So I assume that it's something to do with their storage. Yeah, I mean, from from a, a Ceph perspective, you can shrink an RBD device. You would want to make sure that you shrunk the file system in advance, or uh, <laughs> <laughs> it would be tragic. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if there, you know, what the particular limiting factor is for them. It's also an area that's been changing pretty rapidly. The live operations came out a month ago. These connections with uh, CloudFormation I was mentioning came out this Friday. So um, there may be news coming that we don't know about. Yeah, I think there, like Google announced, they call it hot, the hot grow, being able to hot grow a volume uh, sometime last year. And so they recently added it like yeah. a month and a half ago or something. So it's, yeah, it's an area of innovation. Yeah. And we're in the innovation space, right? We're not lagging so much. As you can see, this is already there. Uh, starting, uh, we're able to introduce the same principle now in OpenStack. But th to your point, there's so much work else to do. And it's not just OpenStack, right? It's AWS as well. It's Google as well. There's limitations that we need to solve for our applications, workloads. Uh, last questions because we're out of time. And uh, I put our, our uh, Twitters as well. So if you need to follow us and, and uh, directly uh, you're more than welcome, and we'll be here available after the talk as well. Any last questions? If not, I want to thank you and enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you. Thank you.